Welcome to Theory of Pets. I'm a passionate pet owner with a drive to help others like me uncover the truth about the pet industry and what goes on behind the scenes. Hi there, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Connor Knight. I'm the president at Top Dog Tips. Um, this is the Theory of Pets podcast. Today, I have Jenna Dockweiler. Uh, she works with Embark Vet. She is Embark Vet's veterinary geneticist, or one of them. Um, Embark Vet is a Boston-based biotech company who fo- focuses exclusively on canine genetic screening. Uh, they are the only canine genetic company that uses a research-grade DNA genotyping platform that our industry-leading scientists developed at Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, not only does that mean that they can give the most accurate results as far as um, the breeds that are the different breeds that your dog has in them, or if uh, you know what the lineage is, um, it can give you the greatest potential to make future genetic discoveries. Every dog in their database also brings them closer to realizing the goal of ending preventable preventable disease in dogs. Sorry for that. Um, <laughs> word salad. But thank you for coming on today, Jenna. I'm excited for this conversation. We'll be talking about um, breeding practices. And if you're a dog owner or want to be a new uh, a new dog owner, how to look for, you know, the best breeders out there and, and best practices and make sure you're just armed with education so you can make the best decision. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Cool. So let's start off with question number one. Now, I, I know we're supposed to dive into, you know, breeding. Um, but I, I'm very curious about your job as a vet veterinary geneticist. So what does a veterinary geneticist do and how is there some overlap with your roles in the idea of responsible breeding? Yeah, so as a veterinary geneticist at Embark, my main role is genetic counseling. So what that means is that I help veterinarians, breeders, and pet owners understand their genetic results that our test returns. So our team also works very closely with our scientists to help make new genetic discoveries as well. So in terms of a breeding setting, this means helping breeders understand how to appropriately apply those genetic results to their breeding program. So for example, if we have a condition that's inherited in a recessive manner, which means a dog needs two copies of a mutation to show that disease, I would advise that breeder not to breed two carriers for that condition to one another because Mm -hmm. doing so would result in 25% of those puppies being at risk for that condition. So this role really matches my background well as a boarded theory genologist, which is a specialist in animal reproduction, um, and it helps breeders avoid putting their puppies at risk for genetic diseases. Got it. So I was just going to ask, um, you, how do you pronounce it? Ther- Theriogenologist? Sorry. Theriogenologist. Theriogenologist. <laughs> yep. I apologize. No, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me. Um, <clears throat> so what specifically does that like entail? You said that you're able to see recessive genes. So does Embark Vet actually work with breeders? specifically yep. oh wow yes, okay because i i i only knew like the, the you know the public side of the company if someone wanted to buy a dna test for their dog so i yeah. i didn't really know that they work with breeders is that something that they've always done yeah yeah that is something that we've always done we do work with breeders pet owners and veterinarians okay and then i also see you um also are um a, a veterinary acupuncturist Yes. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Cause I, you know, I know about acupuncture for humans. I've, I've heard about acupuncture for dogs, but I don't know of like the benefits. So like, I know absolutely just imagine I know nothing about it. And you're, you're telling me like why acupuncture is, you know, pretty cool for a dog. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So simply put, acupuncture is the placement of needles under the skin at specific points in order to elicit a physiologic response. That's kind of the the definition. So often those responses are healing in nature. So acupuncture is not a cure-all by any means. It cannot replace Western medicine, but it can be a really, really complementary modality for a lot of patients. 
So I'm actually certified in physical rehabilitation as well. So in my rehabilitation setting, I mostly used acupuncture for pain control and mobility enhancement. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really, really helps some of some of these patients. And then there are other points for other conditions. So in my reproductive life, <laughs> there are acupuncture points that can also help augment labor and increase milk production. Wow. So I used it a bit for that as well. And it really, in almost every case, there's no detriment to trying acupuncture acupuncture and it can have some really, really profound benefits. That's amazing. I've never, I didn't know that. So they can, uh, honestly, acupuncture, it sounds like it could also help, you know, dogs that are in heat or, you know, trying to give birth, you know, to help either relieve the pain or help them, you know, be able to provide enough milk for their puppies. Yeah. Yeah. There are definitely a lot of acupuncture points with a lot of different uses (laughs) that that stem through all body systems. Okay. Um, So, now let's dive into some of the um, breeding stuff I want to ask you today. So, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have, um, you know, seen a lot of different breeders or at least like been around them because my mom, she loves Yorkies. Um, and so she, you know, she has the financial means to buy a purebred mm-hmm. Yorkie. So can you, but I, I don't know any of the science behind it. Can you tell me a little bit like why purebreds are so coveted um, and and why there comes a lot of health problems with being a purebred dog? Yeah. So really the main benefit to owning a purebred dog is consistency. So Mm -hmm. dogs of a certain breed are going to be a similar size, a similar coat type, similar temperament, and they're going to have similar exercise requirements. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people like that predictability, especially when they're adding a puppy to the family, especially in regards to size. So of course it's true that there are breed associated ailments. I mean, most, most folks know that I think, um, but there are also many conditions that are just simply dog problems Mm -hmm. or maybe potentially have more to do with body size rather than breed alone. So a good example of that would be post spay urinary incontinence. Um, And really responsible breeders, which is what we're going to be talking about today, are working really hard to reduce and eliminate those conditions that plague the breeds that they love. Got it. Okay. And and you work with those breeders to help them make the most, I guess, ailment free, um, pure breeds and just dog breeds in general. Yes. Now, what is your take on pure breeds and mixed breeds? Do you find that they are healthier or do you find that it doesn't, it's more just the care of the dog or, you know, some of them are more prone to it, but are avoidable. Like what are your thoughts on the difference between purebreds health and like in, in, in mixed breeds. Yeah, there, I mean, there are some diseases that are certainly breed associated and pretty heavily breed associated, but responsible breeders are trying to breed away from that. Yeah. And then there are other things that, that we're going to see in all dogs, you know, regardless of, of what their breed mix may be. Got it. Okay. And then can you tell me about the process of a breeder and, and how careful they have to be to prevent any health issues? Like what kind of, what kind of measures do they take and, and how does Embark Vet um, help them make sure they take those health measures or, or sorry, measures. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So again, responsible breeders are going to work super hard to ensure that they're producing healthy puppies. So they're going to test for any health conditions that are recommended by their parent club or their national breed club. Mm -hmm. And they're often going to run additional tests as well. So I'll just use myself as an example. I have a Welsh Springer Spaniel and I'm planning on breeding her probably on her next heat cycle. So she's been tested for hip dysplasia, both through the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals and Pen Hip. Those are two different hip dysplasia tests. She's been tested for elbow dysplasia, autoimmune thyroiditis, which is a thyroid condition and heritable eye conditions. So those are the four tests that are required by our breed club. Mm -hmm. But I've also had her heart screened by echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart to make sure that it's pumping blood forward appropriately. She doesn't have any leaky valves or anything like that. And she's been DNA tested to ensure that she's not passing on any of the known heritable conditions to her puppies. And uh, many breeders are also going to mandate that you test your puppy, even if he or she is just a pet, because it's really good information for them to have on those dogs that they produce. So that can include DNA tests as well as other tests. So hip and elbow x-rays. 
And so I think that's that's kind of like the the testing mm-hmm. sort of side of that question. And then those responsible breeders are also going to ensure that they have a good start in life to prevent any environmental health issues because of store, of course we still have viruses and bacteria and things that that can affect puppies. So what that means is that they're going to keep those adult dogs up to date on their vaccines. Some breeders will even send those puppies home, having had one set of shots already. Mm -hmm. They're going to keep that environment clean, make sure any visitors sterilize their hands and their shoes before interacting with those puppies. Since their immune systems aren't quite as developed as an adult dog, they can't fight off infection quite as well. And they're also going to ensure that those puppies have good footing in the whelping box, which is the where they spend about the first three weeks or so of their life. It's like the little nesting box that the the dam gives birth in. Mm -hmm. So slick flooring during the time when they start to learn to walk, which is typically around two or three weeks of age, has been associated with the development of hip dysplasia. So they're going to make sure that there's good footing to avoid that. Um, And then, of course, in some cases, despite everyone's best efforts, health conditions can arise. If that does occur, the breeder should offer you lifelong support. And that's really a hallmark of of a responsible breeder. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You, you covered a lot there. I was gonna, just going to ask what it meant to be a good breeder, but I wanted to ask you, um, so you have a Welsh Springer Spaniel, is that what you said? Yes. Um, do you feel like, um, those, those, uh, tests you did, do you feel like her, is it a he or she? She. She. Do you feel, sorry. Yeah, of course. Uh, you, the okay. Cycle. Um, do you feel like, uh, her diet has anything that you know, do you feel like it plays a role? And if so, do you like, I, I, I just like to ask people if they are pet owners, like what their thoughts are on, you know, commercial dog food versus homemade dog food or what they feed their dog. If they feel like it plays a role in those kinds of, um, uh, I guess health problems that they're more prone to. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly think it can. So I'll just tell you, I feed a commercial dog food Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it's complete and balanced. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the homemade diets can be really hard to get balanced correctly. Yeah. So certainly if somebody wants to pursue that, I'd recommend working with a veterinary nutritionist who is a Mm -hmm. veterinarian who's had additional training in nutrition. Uh, So I feed a commercial dog food. It's worked really, really well for her. You know, she's got solid stools, a nice shiny coat. Her weight is good. So, so that's what I do. Awesome. Okay. I just wanted to ask. So next question, what, where are the best places to start for uh, like looking for a breeder? What would you recommend? Yeah. So one place to look would be the National Parent Club website. Mm -hmm. So that's the the best place probably to start, I would say, Mm -hmm. um, if you are dealing with an, you know, an AKC breed. Um, So they, those breeders, if they're listed on that site, will have to follow a code of ethics. Mm -hmm. Um, So they'll, they'll have to sign that and make sure that they're, they're health testing in order to be listed on that site. So that's one good spot. Another good spot to look would be Good Dog, which is a website that's designed to, you know, match pet parents, potential pet parents with good breeders. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's another place to look. And then I just want to mention that American Kennel Club registration is great to have, but the AKC's really only function is a registry. So that alone doesn't necessarily insinuate quality. So there are other things that, that these breeders have to do in order to to you know, breed well, well, breed right. Got it. Okay. And then <clears throat> let's say I am interested in, um, you know, getting a specific breed that I want. I've done my research. I've found a breeder. Now I'm going to go meet them or now I'm going to schedule a call or some, some form of communication with them. What kind of questions should I ask them to make sure I do my due diligence and, you know, making sure that they're a good breeder? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I would ask them, how do you decide which dogs you're going to pair up? They'll usually have some rationale behind that in order to improve the next generation. I'd ask them, what health testing do they perform? What health conditions is that breed prone to? If they DNA test any of their breeding animals and or puppies, because DNA testing can be done at any age. Uh, whereas some of the the health tests that we do that rely on x-rays or eye exam or, or anything like that it happened a little bit later in life. Um, I would ask them if they've noticed any non-testable health conditions in their line. We certainly can't test for everything. So the big one that comes to my mind when I think about that would be something like epilepsy. 
Um, I'd ask them if they offer a health guarantee. So a lot of them will say, Hey, if your dog develops hip or elbow dysplasia or whatever the case may be, then they'll offer either another puppy or money back or, or something along those lines. Um, a really big thing to ask them is if my circumstances change, are you willing to take the dog back? So that's another really big hallmark of a responsible breeder yeah. is that they're always going to be responsible for their puppies throughout their whole lifetime. Wow. So my older dog is 10 years old. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if I called his breeder tomorrow and said, Hey, I can't keep him anymore. She would take him back for sure. So wow, that's, that's, that's really a, cool. yeah, that's a, a big big hallmark of, uh, of a responsible breeder. So I'd ask them how the puppies are raised. Are they raised indoors? Are they raised in out outdoors? I think most people are looking for an indoor dog. So it's best if they get their start indoors. And then I ask if they raise, use a puppy raising system. So something like puppy culture or Avidog or one of those, you know, programs that, that some of these breeders will use and really what those are early socialization programs. So that means that they will expose those puppies to new sights, new sounds, new smells, new experiences. And the idea is that if we expose them to these experiences when they're young, they'll be better equipped to respond to new stimuli later in life, if that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, they'll, they'll start on things like crate training and potty training, and basic manners. Um, I'd ask about all of that. And then I'd also ask, how do you decide which puppy goes to which family? So a lot of responsible breeders are actually going to make that selection for you. Uh, they don't often let pet owners choose their own puppy. And the reason for that is because they've spent eight weeks with these pups as you know, whereas you're just coming in and spending maybe a couple of hours with them. So they're really going to know their personality best. So they will know if this pup matches your lifestyle, your needs, your wants, probably better than, than you picking out your own puppy. So that's not necessarily a red flag. And it's actually kind of a, a hallmark of a, a good breeder if they're picking your pup for you. Hmm. Um, I'd also ask if they keep in touch with families, how they keep in touch with families, if they offer lifelong support for things like training and grooming and, and things like that. Um, I'd ask if I could meet those parents. The stud dog may not always be on premises, so that's not necessarily a, a red flag. Um, for example, I live in Colorado and the, the stud I'm planning to use is in Illinois. So of course he's not gonna be at my house when, when puppy people come over, but you should at least be able to meet the mom for sure. Um, it would be ideal to see where the litter is raised and meet the remainder of the litter. Um, some breeders don't want strangers coming over to their house, either from an infection control or a safety standpoint. So that's not necessarily a huge red flag, but it's certainly something to ask. Um, and then I would ask what the puppy will come home with. They should at minimum have a little bit of food that they send home so that the puppy isn't changing diet right when he or she arrives at your home. And so you have enough to, to switch on to whatever diet you're planning to feed. And then I would ask also what references do you have and who can I contact? Because a responsible breeder should not be afraid to have you contact either their vet previous puppy buyers, other people in their breed community and people like that. Got it. Wow. That's a that huge a, list. I'm sorry. A, I mean, but no, <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, I, I would say if I, you know, went back and replayed all this and wrote all those down, I feel like I would be very prepared, <laughs> um, for sure. So I, I wanted to ask you, um, what are the other non-testable ailments outside of epilepsy that, um, are common in dogs. The other really big common one that I think of is skin allergies. So mm -hmm. either an allergy to environment, so things like dust, pollen, that sort of thing, or food, mm -hmm. both often present with itchy skin, which can be really, really life altering and expensive to treat. Mm -hmm. So I definitely never recommended breeding allergic dogs when, you know, when I was in practice. So I would certainly ask about those as well if they've ever had allergies in their lines. It, it. It's not perfect, of course. It's not 100% heritable or anything like that. It's a combination of genetics and environment, but it, it would be good to know if, if they've got that in their line. So, and then as far as you um, and, and your uh, Welsh Springer Spaniel, are you planning on keeping any of the puppies? 
Probably not from this litter, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> but I'm not, I'm not sure yet. Um, my parents actually really want a puppy Aww. and I don't necessarily recommend raising two puppies at the same time. It's really difficult to do well. Um, so I'll probably keep one for them and, and raise one for them. And then they'll take him or her when they're all nice and trained up. <laughs> I'm glad you told me that. Cause I, um, I've been, so my, my girlfriend, she has a dachshund. He's 17. Oh my goodness. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this dog that you see, you know, she was staring out the window here earlier. She's two, but I'm like, Oh, we should get another puppy. And oh. I mean, she's like now, right. What is it? It's like after two, they're not necessarily a puppy, but like, I think, you know, you'd probably side with my girlfriend. My girlfriend's like, we are not getting another dog. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I, but I'm like, I, I think it's like a great idea in, in, you know, in my mind and then i'm sure i remember you know dealing when when she was a little puppy it definitely um if you're not prepared um for three dogs and you're not prepared <laughs> for wanting one of them being a puppy or one just leaving a puppy and the other one being a puppy yeah so okay i'll, <laughs> I'll wait a little longer <laughs> um <clears throat> okay so as far as um costs go because I think that's also important when people are looking for specific breeds. I, I know the 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 cost of a, a, a purebred or you know one of those um, pedigree breeds um, definitely can vary compared to like a rescue. Um, what kind yeah. of expenses should one expect to be taken care of uh, before purchasing from uh, a breeder? Yeah, so certainly those puppies should already have been dewormed a couple of times before they come home with you. Mm -hmm. um, that will definitely need to be repeated by you throughout the dog's life, really. Right. But especially as a puppy, we try to, to hit them pretty hard with dewormer at the, the early stages. Mm -hmm. um, they should have been examined by a veterinarian once at least before coming home with you to make sure there's not any congenital heart issues or, you know, umbilical hernias, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they will have also received their first set of vaccines. So those are kind of the, the first expenses that are, you know, taken care of for you before that pup comes home with you. Right. And then things that you should be preparing for, of course, you should have all of your supplies already. So crate, toys, bed, all of that sort of stuff, all, all at the ready at home and training classes lined up. Got it. And then um, as far as let's say I'm interested in a dog and I've asked all those questions you know, for them, I'm sure there's some due diligence making sure that you're the right person for the dog or yeah, you're the right person for the dog. So what questions should I expect? And, and outside of uh, that list that you just listed, you know, how should I be prepared uh, as far as when a reputa reputable breeder like asks me questions, making sure I've, you know, crossed my T's and dotted my I's? Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you ask that list of questions that I just gave you, mm -hmm. I think there are, are you going to be going to be fairly impressed. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I, yeah, no, yeah, he's, yeah. Like, he's like, no, I don't. You, you seem good. <laughs> yeah. But they're certainly going to want to know everything about your lifestyle, your living situation. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure that their puppies are a good fit for you. So a lot of responsible breeders are going to select those puppies for you. So they need to know what, what is going to fit in with your life. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're going to want to know about other pets that are living in the home, either currently or that have lived in the home previously. And they're going to want to know, you know, like what happened to, to those pets if they were rehomed or, you know, anything along those lines. Um, many are going to ask for veterinarian references as well, just to ensure that your previous pets were all well taken care of. Um, and they're going to expect you to sign a contract in almost all cases. So don't be alarmed by that. And mostly what that's going to mandate is that right of first refusal. So if your circumstances do change and they need to take the, the dog back, um, you're no longer, longer able to care for them. They're going to have at least the right of first refusal. Got it. Okay. And then, um, as far as, um, health tests, mm -hmm. now let's say I'm expecting, or I'm, I want to get like a Yorkie or I want to get, you know, a purebred German shepherd, how should I find out, uh, what health tests, you know, my breed needs so I can be prepared? Yeah, absolutely. So there's actually a great search function on the orthopedic foundation for animals website. 
And that's just www.ofa.org. So you can search by breed and it'll list every health test that's required for your breed. I would also recommend consulting with your veterinarian before you make a a puppy purchase. Um, Those recommended health tests are mandated by the National Breed Club for that breed. So there's no AKC input, there's no veterinarian involvement in deciding what those tests are. So 99% of the time, those breed clubs are gonna make excellent choices for what their breed needs to be tested for, but it's good to have the input from your vet as well. Okay, and then, I think, you know, I think it's important to, again, be prepared, like you said, if, if you if your financial situation or your situation for whatever reason, whether it's financial or whatever, uh, changes. But um, I, I would like to, you know, let's say I want to be prepared. Should I like have like a little like account where I have like, I don't know, three months of emergency for a dog or like, what is that? What do you make any recommendations? What would that like, I guess? amount B if you recommend any. Yeah. Yeah. So I certainly do recommend having an emergency fund. That is always a great idea, really in any circumstance in life. Mm -hmm. Um, But also pet insurance can be really, really helpful Mm -hmm. for, for any dog. And it's really, really ideal to get it when those puppies are young and they don't have any pre-existing conditions because Mm -hmm. pet insurance works like the human insurance of old. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, one of my dog has a, a bad knee So anything related to his knee is not going to be covered moving forward into the future if I Mm -hmm. sign him up for pet insurance right now. Mm -hmm. So getting them on it when it's when it's early, when they don't have any health conditions is really ideal. And sometimes those uh, policies will pay out up to 90 percent. You'll still have to have the money up front. (laughs) So it works on like a reimbursement type of model, Um, but it still can be really, really helpful. So I recommend pet insurance for absolutely every dog and cat. Okay, so like my dog, you know, I've been thinking about it just because my girlfriend, uh, her dachshund has had back surgery um, and some other issues that have been, you know, life changing for someone like me <laughs> financially. Yeah. So um, she's two, my, my dog's two. Do you feel like it'd be fairly, you know, reasonable price wise as far as getting pet insurance? And she's, she's perfectly healthy. Absolutely. Yep. Typically two or under is what their first premium bracket is. It's going to depend on the company, of course. Okay. Um, so two years of age is a great time to get, get insurance if you don't have it already. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, and then uh, as far as um, making sure now, now I've gone through the whole process of the, the breeders interviewed me. I've interviewed them. I've put, I guess, money down or purchased the breed. How long should I expect to wait before receiving my new puppy? It's going to depend a little bit on the breed and your area and how far you're willing to travel and and all those, those sorts of things. But some responsible breeders do have a years long wait list. So that little female Welsh Springer, I waited almost two years for, (laughs) but I also knew that I wanted her from a specific breeder, from a specific cross, you know, so it was a little bit more of a a specific situation, but sometimes it can be years. So I certainly wouldn't expect instant gratification, or I wouldn't expect something to fall into exactly the timeframe that you're looking for. You know, like if you want to get a puppy when the kids are out of school in the summer, Mm -hmm. it's biology, right? So they don't always cooperate on our schedules. (laughs) So I I wouldn't expect that necessarily. Um, Sometimes they'll have pups sooner, but potentially expect a wait. Wow. That's, I did not know that at all. That's crazy. (laughs) Um, Two years. Well, uh, what should I consider if I'm looking to breed my dog? Let's say I now have, or I'm in your situation. I have a Welsh, Welsh Springer Spaniel. What should I consider if I'm looking to breed my dog? Yeah. So things that I would consider would be, have they passed all of their health testing required for that breed? And have they been DNA tested that can give us some additional information beyond what is potentially required by the, the breed club. Are they otherwise generally healthy? So don't have things like skin allergies or epilepsy or things that that we're not able to test for necessarily. I would ask myself if they fit into that breed standard and if they've proved themselves in some way. So like in the show ring or, you know, hunting, herding, companion events, whatever the case may be. Do they have a nice temperament? Of course, that's 
very, very important for, for any dog that we're looking to breed. And then I would ask myself, am I willing to put in the time and effort it requires to raise a litter properly? So doing all of that early socialization, uh, making sure that I match those puppies to the right families, that, that sort of thing, as well as just the, the legwork of cleaning up a lot of poop a lot of times a day, <laughs> if, if I've got the time and the energy to, to do that. And then I would also ask, am I able to handle the expense associated with breeding a dog correctly? So, and plan for unforeseen circumstances. So breeding dogs can cost thousands of dollars. And I don't just mean the, the purchase price. I mean, like the actual breeding them together. There are a lot of tests that we do um, when the, the dam comes into heat to determine when the correct time to breed her is, which we certainly don't have to get into here. <laughs> and then sometimes we'll, we'll ship semen from, you know, different parts of the country or even overseas. And that can add up very quickly stud fees. Um, so that can cost thousands. You're really unlikely to make your money back if you do it right, especially just for one specific dog by the time you put all this money out up front. Um, and then unforeseen circumstances. So sometimes dogs do need C-sections and that can be a very expensive surgery, especially when it's done on an emergency basis, which it mostly is. So, and typically happens at two in the morning because they, they don't like to abide by our schedules. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. It's awesome. And then <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you, um, does Embark Vet work with rescues? Do you guys have any affiliation with any? Yeah, yeah, we do work with some rescues for sure. Most really? most of the rescues are interested in their breed mixes. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, got it. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, and and what what are your thoughts on I guess choosing a breeder versus a rescue? Yeah, absolutely. I think both are great ways to add a, a new friend to your family for sure. So okay. there's nothing wrong with re supporting a responsible breeder, nothing wrong with supporting a responsible rescue. They really are both truly on the same team. Mm -hmm. So same goal, no more homeless pets, right? right. So those rescues are going to accomplish that by adopting pets into new homes. Mm -hmm. And those breeders are going to accomplish that by matching those puppies with suitable homes in the first place so that they don't end up in rescue and then taking them back if, if something does change so that they're not, you know, in the, in the shelter system. And one other thing I would mention, a lot of times the National Breed Club will have breed specific rescues. So they will try to pull dogs that do end up in shelters of their breed or breed mix mm -hmm. so that they aren't taking up valuable shelter space. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, as far as, um, choosing a rescue or versus choosing a breeder. Yeah, I guess that I, I was just curious. Anyways, I think, um, I think we also touched on, I found a breeder. How do I look into them further? I think you touched on that. So, so, all right. So this has been very helpful. Um, we've covered a lot of information. Um, hopefully people listening took some notes. If you're driving <laughs> your car, don't take notes and drive. Uh, pull over, take some notes if you want to, but, or re-listen to this podcast, but, um, talk about a little bit about Embark Vet and how people can find Embark Vet and, um, what, um, I guess what breeders you guys specifically work with that work nationwide that you would recommend. Yeah. So we work with breeders all the way from very small hobby breeders. So folks who have, you know, a day job and just, just do the, the breeding for the love of the breed all the way up to, you know, the larger scale breeders. We will, are happy to work with all of them. Really our goal is to end preventable diseases in dogs. So we're trying to come at it from all angles. Um, so yeah. So like you said, Embark Vet is a, a canine DNA testing company. We are based in Boston. Uh, and you can find us online at www.embarkvet.com. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jenna. Thank you so much for being on here today. Um, that's going to do it for us here at the Top Dog Tips Theory of Pets podcast. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you all have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon.